Book Two, Sections Nine and Ten of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Sections Nine and Ten. Section Nine. In the governments of Lacedaemon and Crete, and indeed in all governments, two points have to be considered. First, whether any particular law is good or bad when compared with the perfect state. Secondly, whether it is or is not consistent with the idea and character which the lawgiver has set before his citizens. That in a well-ordered state the citizens should have leisure and not have to provide for their daily wants is generally acknowledged. But there is a difficulty in seeing how this leisure is to be attained. The Thessalian Penestae have often risen against their masters, and the Helots in like manner against the Lacedaemonians, for whose misfortunes they are always lying in wait. Nothing, however, of this kind has yet happened to the Cretans. The reason probably is that the neighboring cities, even when at war with one another, never form an alliance with rebellious serfs rebellions not being for their interest, since they themselves have a dependent population. Whereas all the neighbors of the Lacedaemonians, whether Argives, Mycenaeans, or Arcadians, were their enemies. In Thessaly, again, the original revolt of the slaves occurred because the Thessalians were still at work with the neighboring Achaeans, Perhavians, and Magnesians. Besides, if there were no other difficulty, the treatment or management of slaves is a troublesome affair, for, if not kept in hand, they are insolent and think they are as good as their masters, and, if harshly treated, they hate and conspire against them. Now it is clear that when these are the results, the citizens of a state have not found out the secret of managing their subject population. Again, the license of the Macedonian women defeats the intention of the Spartan constitution and is adverse to the happiness of the state. For a husband and wife being each a part of every family, the state may be considered as about equally divided into men and women, and therefore in those states in which the condition of the women is bad, half the city may be regarded as having no law. And this is what has actually happened at Sparta. The legislator wanted to make the whole state hardy and temperate, and he has carried out his intention in this case of men, but he has neglected the women who live in every sort of intemperance and luxury. The consequence is that in such a state wealth is too highly valued, especially if the citizen fall under the dominion of their wives, after the manner of most warlike races, except the Celts and a few others who, have, who openly approve of male loves. The old mythologer would seem to have been right in uniting Ares and Aphrodite, for all warlike races are prone to love either of men or of women. This was exemplified among the Spartans in the days of their greatness. Many things were managed by their women, but what difference does it make whether women rule or the rulers are ruled by women? The result is the same. Even in regard to courage, which is of no use in daily life and is needed only in war, the influence of the Lacedaemonian women has been most mischievous. The evil showed itself in the Theban invasion when, unlike the women of other cities, they were utterly useless and caused more confusion than the enemy. This license of the Lacedaemonian women existed from the earliest times and was only what might be expected. For during the wars of the Lacedaemonians, first against the Argives and afterwards against the Arcadians and Messenians, the men were long away from home, and on the return of peace, they gave themselves into the legislator's hand, already prepared by the discipline of a soldier's life, in which there are many elements of virtue, to receive his enactments. But when Lycurgus, as tradition says, wanted to bring the women under his laws, they resisted, and he gave up the attempt. These, then, are the causes of what then happened, and this defect in the Constitution is clearly to be attributed to them. We are not, however, considering what is or is not to be excused, but what is right or wrong, and the disorder of the women, as I have already said, not only gives an air of indecorum to the Constitution considered in itself, but tends in a measure to foster avarice. The mention of avarice naturally suggests a criticism on the inequality of property. 
while some of the Spartan citizens have quite small properties, others have very large ones, hence the land has passed into the hands of a few. And this is due also to faulty laws, for although the legislator rightly holds up to shame the sale or purchase of an inheritance, he allows anybody who likes to give or bequeath it. Yet both practices lead to the same result, and nearly two-fifths of the whole country are held by women. This is owing to the number of heiresses and to the large dowries which are customary. It would surely have been better to have given no dowries at all, or, if any, but small and or moderate ones. As the law now stands, a man may bestow his heiress on any one whom he pleases, and, if he die intestate, the privilege of giving her away descends to his heir. Hence, although the country is able to maintain fifteen hundred cavalry and thirty thousand hoplites, the whole number of Spartan citizens fell below one thousand. The result proves the faulty nature of their laws respecting property, for the city sank under a single defeat. The want of men was their ruin. There is a tradition that, in the days of their ancient kings, they were in the habit of giving the rights of citizenship to strangers, and therefore, in spite of their long wars, no lack of population was experienced by them. Indeed, at one time Sparta is said to have numbered not less than ten thousand citizens. Whether this statement is true or not, it would certainly have been better to have maintained their numbers by the equalization of property. Again, the law which relates to the procreation of children is adverse to the correction of this inequality. For the legislator, wanting to have as many Spartans as he could, encouraged the citizens to have large families, and there is a law at Sparta that the father of three sons shall be exempt from military service, and he who has four from all the burdens of, of the state. Yet it is obvious that, if there were many children, the land being distributed as it is, many of them must necessarily fall into poverty. The Lacedaemonian constitution is defective in another point, I mean the ephoralty. This magistracy has authority in the highest matters, but the ephors are chosen from the whole people, and so the office is apt to fall into the hands of very poor men, who, being badly off, are open to bribes. There have been many examples at Sparta of this evil in former times, and quite recently, in the matter of the Andrians, certain of the ephors who were bribed did their best to ruin the state. And so great and tyrannical is their power, that even the kings have been compelled to court them, so that in this way, as well together with the royal office, the whole constitution has deteriorated, and from being an aristocracy has turned into a democracy. The ephoralty certainly does keep the state together for the people are contented when they have a share in the highest office, and the result, whether due to the legislator or to chance, has been advantageous. For if a constitution is to be permanent, all the parts of the state must wish that it should exist, and the same arrangements be maintained. This is the case at Sparta, where the kings desire its permanence because they have due honor in their own persons, the nobles because they are represented in the council of elders, for the office of elder is a reward of virtue, and the people because all are eligible to the ephoralty. The election of ephors out of the whole people is perfectly right, but ought not to be carried on in the pe present fashion, which is too childish. Again, they have the decision of great causes, although they are quite ordinary men, and therefore they should not determine them merely on their own judgment, but according to written rules and to the laws. Their way of life, too, is not in accordance with the spirit of the Constitution. They have a deal too much license, whereas in the case of the other citizens, the excess of strictness is so intolerable that they run away from the law into the secret indulgence of sensual pleasures. Again, the council of elders is not free from defects. It may be said that the elders are good men and well trained in manly virtue, and that, therefore, there is an advantage to the state in having them. But that judges of important causes should hold office for life is a disputable thing, for the mind grows old as well as the body, and when men have been educated in such a manner that even the legislator himself cannot trust them, there is real danger. Many of the elders are well known to have taken bribes, and to have been guilty of partiality in public affairs, and therefore they ought not to be irresponsible, yet at Sparta they are so. But, it may be replied, all magistracies are accountable to the ephors. Yes, but this prerogative is too great for them, and we maintain that the control should be exercised in some other manner. Further, the mode in which the Spartans elect their elders is childish, 
and it is improper that the person to be elected should canvass for the office. The worthiest should be appointed, whether he chooses or not. And here the legislator clearly indicates the same intention which appears in other parts of his constitution. He would have his citizens ambitious, and he has reckoned upon his, this ability in the election of the elders, for no one would ask to be elected if he were not. Yet ambition and avarice, almost more than any other passions, are the motives of crime. Whether kings are or are not an advantage to states, I will consider at another time. They should at any rate be chosen, not as they are now, but with regard to their personal life and conduct. The legislator himself obviously did not suppose that he could make them really good men. At least he shows a great distrust of their virtue. For this reason the Spartans used to join enemies with them in the same embassy, and the quarrels between the kings were held to be conservative of the state. Neither did the first introducer of the common meals called Phidicia regulate them well. The entertainment ought to have been provided at the public cost, as in Crete, but among the Lacedaemonians, every one is expected to contribute, and some of them are too poor to afford the expense. Thus the intention of the legislator is frustrated. The common meals were meant to be a popular institution, but the existing manner of it regulating them is the reverse of popular for the very poor can scarcely take part in them, and according to ancient custom those who cannot contribute are not allowed to retain the rights of citizenship. The law about the Spartan admirals has often been censored, and with justice. It is a source of dissension, for the kings are perpetual generals, and this office of admiral is but the setting up of another king. The charge which Plato brings in the laws against the intention of the legislator is likewise justified. The whole constitution has regard to one part of virtue only, the virtue of the soldier, which gives victory in war. So long as they were at war, therefore, their power was preserved, but when they had attained empire they fell, for of the arts of peace they knew nothing, and had never engaged in any employment higher than war. There is another error equally great into which they have fallen. Although they truly think that the goods for which men contend are to be acquired by virtue rather than by vice, they err in supposing that these goods are to be preferred to the virtue which gains them. Once more, the revenues of the state are ill-managed. There is no money in the treasury, although they are obliged to carry on great wars, and they are unwilling to pay taxes. The greater part of the land being in the hands of the Spartans, they do not look closely into one another's contributions. The result which the legislator has produced is the reverse of beneficial, for he has made his city poor and his citizens greedy. Enough respecting the Spartan constitution, of which these are the principal defects. End of section 9「Book Two, Sections Nine and Ten of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Sections Nine and Ten. Section Ten. The Cretan constitution nearly resembles the Spartan, and in some few points is quite as good, but for the most part less perfect in form. The older constitutions are generally less elaborate than the later, and the Lacedaemonian is said to be, and probably is, in a very great measure, a copy of the Cretan. According to tradition, Lycurgus, when he ceased to be the guardian of King Charles, went abroad and spent most of his time in Crete for the two countries are nearly connected. The Lycians are a colony of Lacedaemonians, and the colonists, when they came to Crete, adopted the constitution which they found existing among the inhabitants. Even to this day the Periisse, or subject population of Crete, are governed by the original laws which Minos is supposed to have enacted. The island seems to be intended by nature for dominion in Hellas, and to be well situated, it extends right across the sea, around which nearly all the Hellens are settled, and while one end is not far the, from the Peloponnese, the other 
almost reaches to the region of Asia, about Triopium and Rhodes. Hence Minos acquired the empire of the sea, subduing some of the islands and colonizing others. At last he invaded Sicily, where he died near Camachus. The Cretan institutions resemble the Lacedaemonian. The helots are the husbandmen of the one, the Perise of the other, and both Cretans and Lacedaemonians have common meals, which were anciently called by the Lacedaemonians not Phoenicia, but Andrea, and the Cretans have the same word, the use of which proves that the common meals originally came from Crete. Further, the two constitutions are similar, for the office of the ephors is the same as that of the Cretan Cosme, the only difference being that whereas the ephors are five, the Cosme are ten in number. The elders, too, answer to the elders in Crete, who are termed by the Cretans the council. The kingly office once existed in Crete, but was abolished, and the Cosme have now the duty of leading them in war. All classes share in the ecclesia, but it can only ratify the decrees of the elders and, uh, and the Cosme. The common meals of Crete are certainly better managed than the Lacedaemonian, for in Lacedaemonia every one pays so much per head, or, if he fails, the law, as I have already explained, forbids him to exercise the rights of citizenship. But in Crete they are of a f more popular character. There, of all the fruits of the earth, and cattle raised on public lands, and of the tribute which is paid by the Perise, one portion is assigned to the gods, and to the service of the state, and another to the common meals, so that men, women, and children are all supported out of a common stock. The legislator has many ingenious ways of securing moderation in eating, which he conceives to be a gain. He likewise encourages the separation of men from women, lest they should have too many children, and the companionship of men with one another. Whether this is a good or bad thing, I shall have an opportunity of considering at another time. But that the Cretan common meals are better ordered than the Lacedaemonian, there can be no doubt. On the other hand, the Cosme are even a worse institution than the Ephors, of which they have all the evils without the good. Like the Ephors, they are any chance persons, but in Crete this is not counterbalanced by a corresponding political advantage. At Sparta every one is eligible, and the body of the people, having a share in the highest office, want the constitution to be permanent. But in Crete the Cosme are elected out of certain families, and not out of the whole people, and the elders out of those who have been Cosme. The same criticism may be made about the Cretan, which has been already made about the Lacedaemonian elders. Their irresponsibility and life tenure is too great a privilege, and their arbitrary power of acting upon their own judgment and dispensing with written law is dangerous. It is no proof of the goodness of the institution that the people are not discontented at it being excluded from it, for there is no profit to be made out of the office as out of the efferalty, since, unlike the ephors, the Cosme, being in an island, are removed from temptation. The remedy by which they correct the evil of this institution is an extraordinary one, suited rather to a close oligarchy than to a constitutional state. For the Cosme are often expelled by a conspiracy of their own colleagues, or of private individuals, and they are allowed also to resign before their term of office has expired. Surely all matters of this kind are better regulated by law than by the will of man, which is a very unsafe rule. Worst of all is the suspension of the office of Cosme, a device to which the nobles often have recourse when they will not submit to justice. This shows that the Cretan government, although possessing some of the characteristics of a constitutional state, is really a close oligarchy. The nobles have a habit, too, of setting up a chief. They get together a party among the common people and their own friends, and then quarrel and fight with one another. What is this but the temporary destruction of the state and dissolution of society? A city is in a dangerous condition when those who are willing are also able to attack her. But, as I have already said, the island of Crete is saved by her situation. Distance has the same effect as the less Demanian prohibition of strangers, and the Cretans have no foreign dominions. This is the reason why the Perise are contented in Crete, whereas the Helots are perpetually revolting. But when lately foreign invaders found their way into the island, the weakness of the Cretan constitution was revealed. Enough of the government of Crete.
End of section 10. End of book 2, sections 9 and 10. Recording by Jennifer Hilo, Hawaii.